Welcome back to the American Dream with Jay McNally. I'm the guest host, Darren Moore. Usually I'm on the other side of the of the table here being Jay's wisecracking sidekick. We've got a real special show here. It's kind of a breakout show. We're actually on the line live with uh, one of the men at the tip of the spear of our efforts in Afghanistan, Colonel Tim Kirk, who is uh, not only a friend of mine, uh, but also a Russell Kirkian to boot, and so we've been we've been talking about some of the trouble that we, we face there, and uh, we're really glad to have you on board with us, there, Colonel. Thank you, thank you very much. The honor is all mine. I assure you. We've got just a few more minutes before the bottom of the hour. I'm going to try to squeeze in this condensed. Um, uh, you, you gave me this outstanding uh, I, uh, recommendation for a book, The Long Way Back, by Chris Alexander, who was a Canadian ambassador six years in Afghanistan. He uses the analogy of this this very famous painting, The Seduction of Yusuf, uh, which it, which paints a picture uh, of seven rooms uh, through which Afghanistan he uses an analogy to go through. And I'm not going to explain the whole thing, but it's important to say that there's kind of been seven stages for Afghanistan. First, the first room uh, Afghanistan was ushered into after 9-11 was the, the rapid fall, of the uh, obviously, of the, the barbaric Taliban regime, then the Bonn Agreement and Hamid Karzai's inauguration. And what's important to point out here is that the Karzai government had real legitimacy and the, there was a prevailing sense of euphoria in the country. In fact, they, they said there, there's a real spring. There was a lot of activity that was happening in Kabul. And the problem is, and a lot of folks don't really understand this. Of course, they understand that you know Osama slipped through the Tora Bora region. But really what happened is the Taliban basically did a feigned withdrawal. They just bugged out. They got the heck out of there. They knew that the, that a whole world of hurt was coming. And so they crossed back over into Pakistan. And so the second rooms, as, as Alexander puts it here, was time spanning... 2003 and 2004, it was a period of neglect. It was a time where uh, the American nation actually kind of took their eye off the ball. And, of course, that's the year that we went, 2003 was the year that we went into Iraq. But during that time, the al-Qaeda and Taliban brain trust in Pakistan was now preparing fresh terrorist attacks in London, Madrid, Istanbul, Indonesia, Yemen, Maghreb, and elsewhere, and essentially had free reign over the border regions in Afghanistan. That was 2003, 2004. Now, the third room, the next step, 2005 and 2006, these militant networks were back on the attack in Afghanistan. We've not really been fighting independent terrorists or uh, Afghan insurgents in Afghanistan, but rather we've been fighting proxies that have been carefully nurtured on Pakistan soil. So the fourth room, encompassing 2007 to 2008, the Taliban and its allies were beaten back. There, there was a bit of a surge, but the Taliban were not defeated. Our counterinsurgency was working, and it was also uh, during that time that we began leaning heavily on Pakistan's leadership to really help be uh, a partner in fighting these Taliban forces. And the thing that's important to point out here is that Pakistan has been very duplicitous in a lot of ways. Um, they've had this two-facedness where they kind of just were going through the motions. They would sometimes give us some lower-level officials, but as we now know, uh, particularly considering that uh, Os Osama bin Laden was killed uh, not a stone's throw away from one of their training academies, that Pakistan really has been, uh, has been funding the Taliban. They've always looked at the Taliban as kind of their, their colonial arm, so to speak, in Afghanistan. The, the fifth room was uh, certainly when the troop levels increased tremendously at the end of Bush's term and with Obama's surge in Afghanistan. And, and so 2011 it has marked the uh, Afghanistan's emergence into the sixth room, which some describe as a new kind of stalemate. The insurgency is still active, but it is no longer a source of panic. Institution building is happening on a serious scale in Afghanistan. And, and in Pakistan, the policy of denial and uh, duplicity is now under scrutiny more than ever. And now the seventh room, I'll quickly point out, is, is the room that still lies ahead, a stage at which true peace is achieved. In order, and in order for this to happen, the Taliban, and this is what uh, and I'm, I'm, I've really uh, stripped straight from Chris Alexander's book, The Long Way Back, that he, he prescribes after being six years there that in order for there to be a lasting peace, the Taliban must give up its goal of reconquering Afghanistan and the Afghans must dispense with their dangerous dream of a triumphant Pashtunistan with, uh, by taking back uh, certain regions in, in, in Pakistan as well. So also, uh, you know, we've got the whole question of Kashmir in there. But So let me, let me turn to Colonel Kirk, who's, who's on the line with us in Kabul, Afghanistan, and ask him, 
Um, you know, Karzai took a lot of heat for trying to reconcile with the Taliban, and it ended up being a bit of a ruse where the Pakistanis uh, found out that there were some people getting ready to uh, to reconcile with Afghanistan, and they they and with our help helped sweep them up, and now they're being protected. And so, let's let's just ask the question: What do you think, Colonel Kirk? Uh, victory looks like there, and and how and and whether we should be trying to reconcile these Taliban forces that are stationed in Pakistan? Well, I would just begin answering that question by mentioning that my job has me talking with regular Afghan people, not politicians, you know, not military types, but the regular Joes on the street. And I say that because it's, I think it's an important distinction. It's kind of like I, I say to my friends here, if the only thing you knew about America was from spending time in Washington, D.C. with American politicians. How well would you know America? Well, it's the same uh, that's true here. And the, the average Afghan people can answer that question relatively simply in the sense that victory looks like an Afghanistan that has strong institutions and has uh, a government that's by, with, and for the Afghan people. And that's precisely what the international community is trying to establish. And uh, it's interesting to point out, you know, you mentioned kind of the, uh, the seven rooms model, and I have a great deal of respect for Ambassador Alexander and his analysis there. But the death of King Zahir Shah uh, in 2007, I think, plays into this significantly, because he really added a sense of vision and a sense of stability to the Karzai administration as an advisor that uh, is sorely missing. And I was just talking with Prince Nadir, uh, the grandson of Zahir Shah, two weeks ago, and we were talking about that. What's needed here is, is just time uh, in order to allow for the development strategies and the institution-building strategies to take hold and work, uh, as well as getting, as you mentioned, Alexander mentioned, Pakistan to give up their colonial notions in Afghanistan. But if you look at, look at it from a historical perspective, take the example of South Korea, it took 35 years of our engagement in South Korea before they had their first democratic elections. Mm. So we've already had a couple of democratic elections here. Uh, even though corruption was a problem, they, they still were, were relatively democratic. Uh, and the progress here has been pretty fast relative to other places. But 60 years of engagement in South Korea has certainly produced uh, positive results, even though the growing pains were there along the way. Uh, they're the fourth largest GDP in Asia, and they're hosting the 2018 Winter Olympic Games. And I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility for us to expect the same things from Afghanistan 50 years from now. Ugh. But that doesn't mean that, that we're going to be there for 50 years. I mean, let me play the devil's advocate here a little bit. I, I promise I was going to ask some tough questions. And when you start talking like that, Colonel Kirk, i got to tell you that, you know, there's a lot of us that are opposed to nation-building, and that we don't think it's our job to, to do that, that kind of work. And it seems that at this point, after all of this effort, if the, if the insurgency has been beaten back, Afghan army strength now is at, uh, is at 98,000. Isn't it a time at which we can say, hey, listen, they can now carry and shoulder the heavy military load in Afghanistan? Sure, we might be there to, to work on our partnerships like we would with any other partner, uh, but the military part of this and the nation-building aspect of this might need to come to an end. What, what are your thoughts on these objections that are, frankly, quite widely heard across America? Well, I'm certainly sympathetic to those concerns. As you know from our conversations before, I, I understand and support the argument that you made about nation-building. Uh, but we've tried that policy before in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. We've tried it. Most, most people don't realize that we began our engagement in Afghanistan in the early 1950s. President Eisenhower was the first president to visit Afghanistan in 1959, and it was a part of our Cold War posture in containing Soviet communism that we were engaged in Afghanistan through the 1950s, through the 1960s, and then pulled out precipitously in 1970 and 71. Then, of course, a revolution took place in 1973, which then opened the door for the Soviets to come in in 1979. We re-engaged throughout the 80s and then precipitously withdrew in 1989-1990, and that directly contributed to what we saw with the advent of the Taliban and al-Qaeda. So from a historical perspective, we have attempted the policy of ignoring Afghanistan before, and we've been proven twice 
that uh, that does not comport with the uh, national interests of the United States or the Western world for a number of reasons, not the least of which is what you described with the problem with Pakistan. So while it may be difficult and, and at times very costly in terms of, of treasure and, and human life, consider the places where we have been engaged. I mean, we're still in Britain. We're still in Germany. We're still in Italy. We're still in Japan, and we're still in South Korea. If somebody wanted to make a principled argument about saving money by bringing troops home, I, I think the first in, first out management <laughs> methodology would apply in the sense that if we pulled out of Britain, I think the British would be just fine. Yeah. Same is true of Germany and all the others. But if you're going to look for places to pull back based upon a principled approach like you described or a principled economic approach, it seems to me the places that you look to pull from are the places where your national interests are not directly threatened and stay focused on the places that threaten you. As I mentioned, we tried twice before of pulling out of Afghanistan and ignoring the region, and it got us the Soviet invasion and, and certainly 9-11. And we just have to ask the question of how expensive was 9-11, and how expensive would a future 9-11 be, particularly if nuclear weapons or, or you know, nuclear material was involved? Well, that's a, you know, that's, a, that's a great point, because one of the things that is a, is a really cloudy area, and of course, uh, in, in the fog of war, the first casualty is the truth. And so a lot of folks look at uh, this, this increased drone bombing activity that's going on in Pakistan. A lot of folks are really worried about it touching off a war with Pakistan. Uh, first of all, as, as we've talked before, we understand that the Taliban basically just withdrew out of Afghanistan when the Americans came in, moved in, set up shop uh, in Pakistan, where, frankly, they had been working for, for decades. But it, how, do we, how can we, as civilians here in America, we hear about these drone attacks, we don't know who we're bombing. It, it just seems like we're, we're kicking a beehive. Uh, over as opposed to draining the swamp. Can you, can you help us understand that a little more? Absolutely. Uh, the book that I think best describes kind of this uh, proclivity in Pakistan is uh, by Peter Thompson called The Wars of Afghanistan. And that, combined with what you described in the Chris Alexander book, really paints the picture where it's, it's much larger than a military problem. It's a diplomatic problem. It's an economic problem. It's an international problem. Uh, I think you saw the news uh, this week where the Congress decided to suspend $700 million of assistance to Pakistan. Uh, that's the type of thing, you know, where diplomacy and economics really weigh in on the problem, uh, perhaps more so than the military aspect, because our assistance and funding to Pakistan has to be based upon, you know, a good faith relationship. And, and as you mentioned, the book describes um, there's a lot of reason to question that good faith. In fact, a lot of people believe that there's just been rank deception in, in play. Um, I posted an article uh, earlier this week on Facebook that talked about the huge Pakistani lobby effort in Washington. And, Colonel uh, Kirk, you probably heard that the music is uh, the music is up. We're we're in our last minute here, my friend. I got to tell you, um, you know, I, I'm really glad that we had the opportunity to visit. This is, um, we, Americans can often make the mistake of looking at a mountainous subject like this problem and mistaking one side of the mountain for the whole. And we really appreciate you le coming on and helping us walk all over this mountain and get a really good sense of, of really what's happening here. There's a lot more to this, and we've talked to a couple books here. If um, We also want to make sure that folks know that Kirk is available for other interviews, and you can contact him through us here at WAM 1600. Colonel Kirk, thank you, brother. 